A nation can survive its fools, and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within. about the wars, they've been wrong about jobs, they've been wrong about everything. The question is, are they stupid or do they have a plan? I actually think for the most part, they have a plan, but some are not too smart. Welcome to the Horrible Deplorable Show, the anti-globalist America First program dedicated to de-hoaxing the media and destroying the narrative. Here's your host, the founder and editor of The Daily Stir, Matt Wingard. Welcome to The Horrible Deplorable Show. My name is Matt Wingard, and I am The Horrible Deplorable. This is a show for Trump supporters. And normally I would say hello to my good friend Doris, but she is off today for very good reasons, and she will be with us again next week. I want to welcome the Gab community. Everyone listening on Gab, we just recently hit 7,000 followers on Gab, and we're very excited about that. We're now into the 30s in our episode numbers, and you can listen to past episodes of The Horrible Deplorable Show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Pocket Cast. You can go to YouTube. All you have to do is type in The Horrible Deplorable Show, and you will find it. And we have listeners all over the world, and we thank you, Germany and Ireland and everywhere else that's listening. It is a good suggestion to, uh, if you enjoy the show, to go back and listen to previous episodes because we're a mix of current events and also political philosophy and ex- using current events to explain what's been going on and what's going on and what will be going on. So I think most fans of the show would highly advise you if you've found the show and you enjoy it to go back and listen from the beginning. We hope you'll say you learned a lot. Trump tweeted out about North Korea. I'm going to read this tweet, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the reaction to it. He tweeted out, quote, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un just stated that the nuclear button is on his desk at all times. Will someone from his depleted and food-starved regime please inform him that I, too, have a nuclear button, but it is a much bigger and more powerful one than his, and my button works, end quote. So as you can only imagine, the elite anti-Trump media went absolutely nuts over that. Very similar to what happened when Reagan made a joke about bombing the Soviet Union in the 80s right before radio broadcast. It was He was simply testing out the microphone and apparently it went out over the air. But also the never-Trumpers who get the vapors all the time because they would prefer to lose their dignity. They freaked out as well. I do want to explain this tweet specifically and the tweeting in general. As a general rule, I think you know someone asked me recently why he has to tweet things like that. And I've tried to explain this before, and I'm going to do it again. But understand that we now have solid evidence after a year of his administration that he's going to get 95% negative coverage, which means that the entire mainstream media apparatus, with the exception of perhaps 5%, is going to act like a rabid dog against him at all times. It was probably 80% for George W. Bush, 70 to 80 percent for Reagan. But, you know, if you're a Republican, you're already going to be way high up on there in the negative. And if you're a nationalist, anti-elitist, anti-globalist like Trump, it's going to be nearly 100 percent. And what that means is thousands of well-educated people who are also well-trained in the arts of journalistic dissection, autopsy, and warfare, they get up every day and go to work and they have pages to fill or 24 hours of news cycle to fill on TV or 24 hours of airtime on the radio. And they have to fill all that with content. Think of it as just a series of giant cannons aimed at your troops. And imagine a couple hundred cannons. Now imagine a field or a state the size of Rhode Island with tens of thousands of cannons all aimed at your troops. That's the media every day and every week. They have barrels of ink and countless minutes and hours of airtime to fill. Donald Trump understands intuitively that that is all going to be aimed at him. And so what he decides to do, rather than trying to convince them or to expect that he's going to get a larger share of positive coverage, he simply accepts the reality. And I think decades of being in New York solidified this for him. He accepts the reality that all of that is going to come at him. And so he does 
misdirection by aggressively tweeting and by picking his own fights, by starting his own fights, by deciding I'm going to tweet this, which I know will piss a whole bunch of people off or cause them to get stirred up. He decides, essentially, what they're going to spend the next 24 hours writing about. And they dutifully train a large number of their cannons on the things that he decides to do, that he proactively chooses as the battlefields. And understand that while he's doing that, all of his people that he's appointed in the administration are dutifully going about their work, pulling us out of the Paris Accord, dismantling the EPA, rolling back regulations, passing tax cuts, deporting illegals. On and on it goes. Left to their own devices, the media would be spending all of their time and their ink carefully dissecting everything that Trump is doing and and they would the the editors would be sitting down on Monday and deciding okay next week we've already got our plan for this week but next week we're going to I need a bunch of reporters assigned to do long form pieces because we're going to next Monday we're going to come totally at Trump on everything he's doing on immigration and we're going to tell a bunch of bleeding heart stories and we're going to make him out to be a boogeyman and then on Tuesday we're going to talk about what a bungler he is on foreign policy and we're going to go get a bunch of examples of things that aren't working out around the world. I want you to assign some reporters to that. And then on Wednesday, we're going to do an expose on all the people who scientists think have died from environmental disasters and we're going to blame that all on Trump and we're going to talk about what Scott Pruitt's doing at the EPA. And then on Thursday, we're going to we're going to attack big oil all day long and go against Trump's all of Trump's decisions to try to make the country more energy independent. And on and on and on. And you see how they would plan it out and they would sign, assign dozens of people and then they, they would decide every day what the anti-Trump topic was going to be and they would just pound away on, at him. What he does by making the choices that he makes is he says, no, I'm going to have you spend all your time and energy on this new North Korea tweet. And they do. They dutifully eat up a 24-hour cycle spending 60, 70% of their time on that. And then... The stuff that the editor planned doesn't get done, you see? By keeping them constantly aggrieved, by keeping the pot constantly stirred, he distracts them. This is called misdirection, constantly eating up all of that valuable news time so that it isn't directed at the specifics of what he's doing. Now, he can't stop all of it, but he carves away a large chunk of it by keeping the the sort of celebrity press, if you will, the, the, the top of the hour radio broadcasts, you know, the news updates, focused on these inconsequential things, these molehills that they make mountains out of. They don't get into the weeds. They don't report on the things that really matter. And they can't stir up liberals and keep them focused. So on and on it goes. And that's how he's able to accomplish what he's doing. That's how, can you imagine the Arctic Wildlife Refuge, you know, Anwar being opened up? If the press had a clear field to attack that as it was going through. But instead, Trump had them distracted through that whole process. And so then the Republicans dutifully put Anwar on there and shove it through. And there have been a few stories about it, but the press has, hasn't been able to focus on Anwar the way they would if they got to set the agenda. What he's doing is very, very smart, and it's very, very deliberate, and he's going to keep doing it the entire time he's in office. So for all of you wavering Trumpers, you know, I'm not talking to those of you who are like me, who were there from the beginning and who fought for him during the primaries. I'm talking about all the Republicans who wanted somebody else in the primary, but dutifully got on board, and they're sort of only 50-50 with Trump at all times because, my, the man is an ogre. They just can't get over the style. But understand that the style has a very specific purpose in our 24-hour news cycle, in our media and social media saturated environment. He understands how to survive and thrive and get things done in a way that previous presidents from the old school just couldn't. Bush, W. Bush had take, took this sort of I'm above it all, I'm, you don't even respond to that stuff, the presidency is regal. And he was absolutely eviscerated during his time in office. It's a philosophy that doesn't work. It does not recognize the modern realities of media. And it's a recipe for failure. And Trump has totally rejected it. Now, on the specifics of the tweet itself, I have suggested in this podcast that I worry that the Chinese sort of understand this game very well and that they that North Korea is, is a dog on a leash and that it's always on a leash and that nothing North Korea ever really does upsets the Chinese. I firmly believe that China could end North Korea any time that it wanted to. 
We've got evidence of that, and I'll get to it in a second. But the point is, is that I believe that the Chinese understood as Trump got elected that they were sort of the focal point, trade-wise and economically, of his agenda. And they needed to distract him. They needed to make something more important. And so by unleashing North Korea, and you've noticed that very, it, it's very timely, that essentially as soon as he came into office, North Korea began to ratchet up what it was doing, how often it was firing off a missile. This seems very purposeful to me. And it worked like a charm because the president made this his number one priority. And he's even admitted it himself that he traded traded away or put away other things in the drawer that he wanted to take up with China in order to get their help solving this problem. Now, recently satellite photos have come out that show the Chinese exchanging oil with the North Koreans. Trump has even tweeted about that. I think he recognizes the game that they're playing as well. And so, if you understand that North Korea is a dog on a leash, and understand what I mean by that, this is not a dog that's off its leash that can get all the way to you. You know, when you have a dog on a leash, you know how to be one foot just beyond the length of that leash. And no matter how terrible and terrifying that dog looks, he can't get beyond the leash. So you could sit there in front of him and taunt him if you need to because he's not getting off that leash. You have to look at Trump's tweet in that perspective. I believe he is essentially signaling to the Chinese that he understands this game very well and that he will taunt the North Koreans because he knows they're not actually going to do anything. Because the Chinese don't want North Korea to actually do anything. North Korea is simply a vehicle for keeping the United States distracted and off balance and not focusing on the economic and trade issues that Trump has talked about. Notice that there was a story a week or two ago about our giving, the U.S. is giving anti-tank missiles to Ukraine. And everybody said, oh, that's Trump just trying to prove he's not with Russia, not in their pocket and all of that. Except that a few days later, it came out that we, apparently, intelligence officials have evidence that Russia's been trading with North Korea in violation of the U.N. resolutions. So it seems to me the more logical conclusion is that Trump understands that Russia is violating the U.N decrees on North Korea and that his way of sending a signal to them is to give anti-tank missiles to the Ukraine. I think he's a much more savvy dealer and negotiator than people give him credit for. And I, I want to make this point again because I did have someone recently tell me that they really were bothered by his tweets and they want him to stop tweeting. I think now that I've explained it, you can understand why he should never stop tweeting. If he were to stop the social media, or if he were to simply tweet innocuous things like make America great again, the kinds of things that don't stir the pot and don't pull media attention, then essentially the seas would totally calm down and the media, this giant octopus that wants nothing more to, than to destroy him, could begin to set their own agenda day by day and week by week, and they could slowly but surely go about dismantling Trump. And by tweeting, and by being controversial, and by doing what he does, he keeps them off balance. And he keeps them, you know, he understands what a good story is. When he does these tweets, the ones that you know, you know when you read them, you're like, Wow, that's really over the top. He understands how that will be interpreted in the, in the Washington Post Bureau and the New York Times Bureau. They can't ignore a tweet like that. They have to go to experts and do a story on, is he being flippant? And is that dangerous foreign policy? And is he going to start a nuclear war with North Korea? And, and you know, isn't this just more evidence that he's a psychotic, right? They, they, they have to do that story. And so that's all time and energy that gets eaten up doing those stories that their talented warriors can't be used for, to do other things. Innocuous tweets like Make America Great Again are not going to pull reporters off of their assignment the way that that North Korea tweet immediately, I can see it in my mind. I can see the editor reading that tweet and suddenly starting to point to people in the newsroom and say, I need a story on this and I need a reaction on that. And somebody from the foreign policy department has to do a reaction story on this. And immediately a bunch of people are pulled off of the other stories they were doing and they have to focus on that. It's brilliant what he's doing. It's absolutely brilliant. And so for those of you who were sort of latecomers to the Trump train and are only tentatively on board, my message is figure it out and stop whining. Because if he actually did what you wanted him to do, we would lose far more often. I just need more people to understand that all of the things that you want are things that the loser Republicans were doing. You know, you wanted a president who took the high road. We had that. Look what it accomplished. Nothing. So stop dreaming of the past because those guys didn't deliver anything. 
This wistful past, when Republicans took the high road, was a loser strategy. And to constantly whine about things that are working, I said when I originally endorsed Trump early on in the primaries, that he will, whether he's actually conservative or not in a way that you individually need him to be, he will get more done for conservatives and libertarians than any so-called conservative president. And he's proven me right in his first year, and believe me, he's just getting started. His list of accomplishments is going to dwarf the last five Republican presidents combined. And so I have no patience for the people that are whining about this. Then there's this controversy going on between Trump versus Bannon, and I want to say a few things about this. I think the president's overreacting to it. I think it, he's falling into a trap, which is very common in the White House, of you sort of get in that bubble, and it's hard to see that there's anything outside that bubble. And the president has not done as many rallies as he used to, and frankly, he needs to get out more and do more rallies because it's just not good, especially for a Republican president, to sit for too long in that bubble in D.C. because you get a very distorted view of what is going on. First of all, this Michael Wolff book that is filled with all these salacious quotes that is going to have the media stirring for a week, I think is half fiction. I think it's a Kitty Kelly type book. I don't think this guy has a lot of scruples, nor does he have a very good reputation. And so it's very easy to do interviews and to take what people say out of context or to embellish what they say or to paraphrase what they say and to make up a lot of things, too. You can slip in things that are true with things that are not true. This is an old trick. It's been done in a lot of books in the past. And people, you know, it's just human nature when you read something to think that it's true. Something in our brain wants to believe that. But I... I I, it's my policy to, to treat this book as fiction and to dismiss it because if you can pull out things like the book claiming that Trump didn't know on election night who Boehner was, and then you can very easily go back and find six tweets from him in the previous two years in which he's scolding or referencing Boehner in one way or another. If you can immediately pull five or ten things from the book and prove them to be false, that's enough. You know, stop trying to deal with every single quote out of the book. So I'm not sure that Bannon said everything that he did. He does have a, kind of a loose mouth, so perhaps he did say him, but I don't think it really matters at the end of the day, and I wish that the president wouldn't get quite as stirred up about this, but he does tend to take this stuff very personally, and I take the good with the bad. It's who he is. I, I think that he and Bannon can, you know, he issued a scathing statement attacking Bannon, saying he's lost his mind. Bannon had been quoted in the book as saying that the meeting with the Russian was treasonous and again i don't give it a lot of credence but i think these two are on the outs temporarily trump will probably cut them off for a while but i wouldn't be surprised if in six months to a year they're talking again and i i don't think at the end of the day that it that it needs to be anything more than we make it out to be bannon's reputation is based on the things that he advocates for and the breitbart website and the fact that it pushes to curtail immigration and illegal immigration and the nationalist agenda. It doesn't ultimately matter whether Bannon and Trump are talking to each other. Bannon can talk to Trump through Breitbart every day by keeping him honest on the things that he promised to do, the, the famous whiteboard in Bannon's office. And Trump understands that. He can knock Bannon around all he wants in a statement, but at the end of the day, Bannon represents that nationalist agenda and all of us who voted for that, and Trump knows that. So the two of them need each other. Whether they like each other or not, is irrelevant and the issues move on. Trump, you know, he's pretty famous for being an alpha male. He doesn't like anyone to pull focus. Alpha males in general don't react well to other alpha males. We haven't had a Republican alpha male in the White House in a number of decades. So one of the things that's got people on the left so stirred up is that such a dominant alpha male is in the White House just at the moment when they they are trying to feminize every aspect of society and sell this idea of everything that makes men men is basically toxic in our world and needs to be eliminated. You can imagine that when you feel like you're making progress on that and that you have all the commanding heights to push that agenda, to suddenly have a guy who in your mind is a throwback this just very strong alpha male come in and have the you know the possession of the bully pulpit and to be able to tweet and push his alpha messages out there every day you know for a lot of people who have a thin hold on their mental health it pops the screws i do think that both bannon and trump have a weakness in that they crave validation from the media it is very clear to anybody who watches this that trump 
has a weak, a soft spot for the New York Times. I don't think he really cares whether the Washington Post or the Kansas City Star or some other newspaper likes him, but he has had a relationship with the New York Times for decades, and they haven't always treated him badly because he wasn't a Republican candidate and he wasn't advocating, you know, he wasn't a danger to their globalist agenda when he was just a real estate developer in New York. And he used to get much favorable coverage from them. And it's his hometown newspaper, and I just think he can't stop giving them interviews because he keeps hoping to get some kind of favorable press from them. Nobody's perfect. This is a soft underbelly for him. And Bannon has the same weakness. Uh, why he's giving interviews to Michael Wolf and to that professor that got him into trouble and got him pushed out of the White House, I it's just a need an innate need to be validated. Look, when I was in the state legislature, I knew there wasn't a single member of the press that I could trust or who wouldn't cut my throat. And I tried to avoid them, but I'll fully admit that and I'm thinking of somebody in specifically who I detested. I let him come into the office and interview me for 20 minutes. Didn't feel good about it after he left, and I didn't particularly like the quote. And I even remember scolding myself like, why did I do that interview? And I was on my guard the whole time. It's not like I convinced myself that I was going to get a good article out of it, but I felt a need to be transparent and, and open and to not look shady or hiding anything. So when he wanted to come in and talk about things, I tried to basically give him as little information as possible, and but to grant the interview. So that impulse is out there, and, and I understand it very well. I think Bannon had a difficult time in the White House. I, he was a, he was obviously a leaker and a source, and he caused a great deal of chaos in the White House. You can see it by the fact that, although he left about the same time as Priebus, I, I think that they were both leaking for their own purposes. And I think what was motivating Bannon was he was quite fearful about a lot of the hires that the president made. Go back a year and understand that a lot of the people that Trump hired were not strong supporters of his and were so used to being let down by people we elect that I think Bannon's instant fear was that personnel is policy and that a lot of these people would be undermining the president and that that stuff wouldn't get done. I think to some degree we've learned over the year, the year in ensuing year, that that Trump is his own man and that they, he can be outnumbered five to one in these meetings and he still pushes for what he wants. So while they temper him, they don't really get to go do their own thing. They end up having to do what he wants. Maybe they don't do it quite as vigorously as he would like, but they still end up doing what he wants, not what they want. And I, I think that I can understand why Bannon had those fears and why he was probably leaking and doing a lot of those things to try to keep the president honest out of, you know, basically whipping the horse to make sure that it goes fast. I don't think it was a smart move. I think you owe the, the president loyalty, and ultimately that's why he got pushed out. And I, I think he understood that he was going to be more effective on the outside running Breitbart, holding the president accountable, than by committing disloyal acts as a staff member from within the White House to try to accomplish the same goal. Last week I talked about Orrin Hatch, and pretty much everything I predicted has come true. Orrin Hatch has retired, and clearly Mitt Romney is going to run for that seat, and this was my concern. As I said last week, I have absolutely no affection for Orrin Hatch, even though he's been buttering up Trump in the last few months. He is total politician. That man has taken so many positions, and half of them were detestable, that I would love to see him go. But if you tell me that he is going to be replaced by Mitt Romney, I say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'll take Orrin Hatch. Because Orrin Hatch has his finger to the winds. And he's actually done a very good job of pivoting towards Trump uh, since Trump got elected. So I'd rather have that than a Mitt Romney, who's so very clearly a never Trumper and a globalist. And I, I you know, I don't, I think the Salt Lake City Tribune went after him only because they wanted Romney. There was an article yesterday from Rona McDaniel, whose last name used to be Romney. She's the RNC chair and Romney's daughter. She was saying that Romney will support Trump's agenda. I don't believe it. And you shouldn't bet on it. I wish that I could say that Utah will reject Romney, but I don't believe it. I think we have a bit of a Mormon problem within the Trump coalition. I think that Mormons, more than others, I was just talking with somebody about this the other day. I think there's a split between evangelicals and Mormons on Trump. I think evangelicals tend to be much more vigorous Trump supporters than Mormons. Mormons in general, tend to fall more in the category of people Republicans who supported somebody else but dutifully voted for Trump. They're sort of in that 50-50 category. And a lot of it has to do with 
the style, matter of fact, it almost entirely has to do with the style aspects of it. Mormons are, I think, a little bit more wedded to the idea of how you behave matters, even if you lose. Better to lose with dignity than to give up your dignity just to achieve an end. And I think evangelicals are more willing to be knife fighters. I think that they're more interested in the outcome than in, in than what it takes to get there. And and perhaps that needs a, a longer explanation, but I think in general that encapsulates it. All of which is to say I believe that Utah will elect Romney. I'd add this to the list, and I certainly will add this to the list of our, our Senate targets, but I'm not sure Romney's going to get a really good primary challenger. And, and unless he does, I suspect it's a foregone conclusion there. It's not like we shouldn't fight, and we should absolutely keep on Romney from day one, never trust him. We ought to be banging on him the whole time. I mean, look, if he's the Republican, Republican nominee, there's zero chance of him losing in the general election in Utah. So it should be a free fire zone on him with all of us making it clear to him that we've got our eye on him from day one. And look, he's still going to betray us. He's going to make all the right motions during the campaign. And then as soon as he gets in the Senate, he is going to be one of Trump's fiercest critics. That is just how it's all going to play out. So he's going to lie a lot during the campaign and be on his best behavior, but it's all BS. Barbra Streisand. And I think that we ought to, even if we can't defeat him in the race, we ought to never buy into his hype or his rhetoric and we ought to be on him like white on rice during the entire campaign process he should get no quarter from those of us on the trump train so that when he finally does begin to to betray us in the senate it will come as no shock to all of us who support the president Things are heating up on the DOJ FBI investigation, something the mainstream press desperately wants to downplay and ignore. But on it goes. Devin Nunes on the House side is expanding the Russian probe to focus on the dossier and how that came to be in the hands of the DOJ and the FBI and whether or not it was used to get that FISA warrant, something that I believe all this crap coming out of the New York Times and Fusion GPS is designed to try to create another narrative, a false narrative some other option i don't think they think people are going to believe this idea that this trump staff member who was in australia and was talking about information coming out about hillary they're trying to suggest that that is what got the fisa warrant and the timeline doesn't work it's completely false but again they don't need it to ring totally as true they're just putting out another narrative to muddy the waters so that at some point you know democrats and others who are going to defend them can latch on to some alternative theory they need to fill the void here and have an alternative theory or the truth about this when it comes out is going to look pretty stark naked and difficult so a lot of this is just positioning and public relations and misdirection on their part to try to keep the focus on the truth which you know is look when it comes out if it comes out I'm surprised as much has come out as it has. I really thought they would have buried this better, but it is leaking out. McCain was neck deep in all of this and never Trumpers, and it was clearly a coordinated effort on the part of intelligence apparatuses of the United States and the Department of Justice and the FBI, law enforcement agencies, to undermine a major party's candidate for president of the United States. That's the truth of it. Chuck Grassley on the other side, you know, he shot down, they, even the um, New York Times published an op-ed from one of the executives at Fusion GPS talking about how they're being scapegoated and, and the truth is in their transcripts when they testified. And Grassley's called them out on this and said, look, you're the one that wanted all that to be private, so don't go around claiming that you're being railroaded. And so he's, you know, look, Chuck Grassley's not a hardcore Trump nationalist. And so when he's ticked off about this and he's joined Devin Nunes on this, you know there's a lot of fire here. It isn't just smoke because these guys are motivated to unravel this and they're not even hardcore Trump supporters. I want to finish on this subject just to tell you that I think it's heating up. Jim Jordan is on the committee on the House side and he did a series of tweets yesterday basically about the questions that he wants to get answered. He titled it 18 Questions in 2018 about Russia and the FBI. The American people deserve answers. I'm going to read this because I think he's got it exactly right, and we do need answers to these questions. Number one, did the FBI pay Christopher Steele, author of the dossier? Number two, was the dossier the basis for securing FISA warrants to spy on Americans? And why won't the FBI show Congress the FISA application? Number three, when did the FBI get the complete dossier and who gave it to them? Dossier author Christopher Steele, Fusion GPS, the Clinton campaign and the DNC, a Senator McCain staffer, 
Number four, did the FBI validate and corroborate the dossier? Number five, did Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, or Bruce Orr work on the FISA application? Number six, why and how often did DOJ lawyer Bruce Orr meet with dossier author Christopher Steele during the 2016 campaign? Number seven, why did DOJ lawyer Bruce Orr meet with Fusion GPS founder Glenn Simpson after the election? To get their story straight after their candidate Clinton lost? Or to double down and plan how they were going to go after President-elect Trump? Number eight, when and how did the FBI learn that DOJ lawyer Bruce Orr's wife, Nellie Orr, worked for Fusion GPS? And what exactly was Nellie Orr's role in putting together the dossier? Number nine, why did the FBI release text messages between Peter Strzok and Lisa Page? Normally, ongoing investigation is a reason not to make such information public. Number 10, and why did FBI release only 375 of over 10,000 texts? Were they the best, the worst, or part of a broader strategy to focus attention away from something else? And when can Americans see the other 96% of the texts. Number 11. Why did Lisa Page leave the Mueller probe two weeks before Peter Strzok? This was two weeks before the FBI and special counsel even knew about the texts. Number 12. Why did the intelligence community wait two months after the election to brief President-elect Trump on the dossier? January 6, 2017. Why was James Comey selected to do the briefing? Number 13. Was the briefing done to legitimize the dossier? And who leaked the fact that the briefing was about the dossier? Number 14. The New York Times reported last week that George Papadopoulos' loose lips were a catalyst for launching the Russian investigation. Was President-elect Trump briefed on this? Number 15. Why did Fusion GPS founder Glenn Simpson meet with Russian lawyer Natalia Veselnitskaya before and after her meeting with Donald Trump Jr. Number 16. Why was FBI counsel Jim Baker reassigned two weeks ago? Was he the source for the first story on the dossier by David Korn on October 31st, 2016? Or was it someone else at the FBI? 17. Why won't the FBI give Congress the documents it's requesting? Number 18. And why would Senator Schumer, leader of the Democrat Party, publicly warned President-elect Trump on January 3, 2017, that when you mess with the intelligence community, they have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. Jim Jordan finishes his series of tweets by saying, It doesn't work that way in America. We are not ruled by unelected bureaucrats, police forces, or intelligence agencies. In America, we the people elect officials who govern. It's a great series of questions, and I think the answers to those questions are absolutely explosive. And the mainstream media is as interested in this as they are in having a tooth extraction. I want to go back to the tax bill again that passed and remake this point that there's an element to this tax bill that heavily punishes the blue states because the part that does not allow for deducting state and local income taxes from your federal income taxes. Now, that falls disproportionately on blue states. There was, at the last minute, a threshold put in. You can deduct the first 10000 But essentially, on high-income earners in blue states, this bill packs a wallop. Now, who are high-income earners in blue states? Essentially, these are, for the most part, people who voted for Hillary Clinton. And I almost never see Republicans do this in their legislation. Democrats do it all the time. They are masters at crafting a bill, an education bill, an environment bill, a tax bill, whatever it is. They're experts at crafting it so that it will target the people they know didn't vote for them, the subgroups, and benefit the people who did. They do this all the time in legislation. And I very seldom see it as well done by Republicans. And this bill, they knew the Democrats wouldn't be on the bill at all, would not vote for it at all. So they decided, hey, since we're doing this without your votes, why should we 
not take an opportunity to pass something that you would obviously not want. Now, this has basically, the reason I want to talk about this again is because it's, it's brilliant, and I want to just congratulate the Republicans in Congress for doing this. But this has basically two great effects. One is is just its actual effect, which is you are politically punishing your enemies and rewarding your friends, which is what Democrats have been doing for decades, and it's about time that Republicans got as good at it. So I just really appreciate the strategy. Anytime Republicans can do something that can have a long-term effect, I'm much, they all, so often in negotiations, they trade away a short-term term gain to Democrats who get a long-term gain, and I'm just tired of seeing it, and it's just exciting to see them do something that's going to provide dividends for at least a decade. This is going to make it very difficult on blue state governors. Very difficult. Cuomo in New York's already pissed because he had plans to do his own tax cut next year, and it's messed up all of that for him, and he's so mad now that he's going to sue on the tax bill, right? I mean, it's just glorious. They know how difficult this makes it for them and that they're going to have to it's not it's making their budget problems worse over the long haul and they understand that in the short term it's going to create a little windfall actually and it's a little complicated but essentially by not allowing these deductions it actually generates a little additional revenue for state coffers which they're not going to talk about so in the short run blue states are going to get a little bit of a bump in their budgets but it's a poison pill because ultimately it's you have a lot of wealthy people in these states who are going to have an incentive to move out of them. You know, this migration from New York to Florida and those kinds of things, this stuff's going to accelerate. And, you know, places like Connecticut and others rely on having a whole bunch of wealthy families there that even if they don't get to tax them at 36%, they still draw a lot of revenue off of them. And if they relocate out to other states, it drains the budgets over time. Very, very effective. The other part of this I love is that it sends a message to the Democrats that there is a consequence for not participating. And it's a great message to send right before you start negotiations on the infrastructure bill, right? Because if Republicans have to pass an infrastructure bill without Democrats, guess where the money's going to go? And so it's a way of communicating that, hey, we aren't dumb. And we understand that whoever participates in the bill gets a piece of it. And I like that message too. This, whether Trump was the instigator of those elements in the bill or not, his very presence has apparently gotten the Republicans to become smarter negotiators. And I just think he has all sorts of ancillary effects like that. His presence just does things like that. And I, I want to circle back and congratulate Republicans again on the elements of this tax bill that were brilliant. Some 40 U.S. companies have responded to the president's tax cut by offering bonuses. Bonuses of up to $2,000, increases in 401k matches, spending on charity. Apparently the list is, the president tweeted out a list from Americans for Tax Reform that had a lot of these 40 on it. I, I saw something today that that list may be up to 100. But just as examples, Aflax increased their 401k match from 50% to 100% on the first 4% of compensation. Uh, BB and and T, $1,200 bonuses for 27,000 employees. Comcast, $1,000 bonuses to 100,000 employees, plus at least $50 billion investment in infrastructure over the next five years. Express Employment Professionals, giving $2,000 bonuses to more than 200 non-executive employees. Gate City Bank, handing out 1,000 bon bonus checks to 538 non-management personnel. Navient, 98% of their 6,700 employees will receive a $1,000 bonus. Regents Financial Corporation making a $40 million charitable donation and agreeing to $100 million in capital expenditures. Southwest Airlines giving $1,000 bonuses to all 55,000 employees. U.S. Bank Corps giving a $1,000 bonus to 60,000 employees. And on and on it went. If you don't think those people aren't going to directly connect that check with what Republicans did in the tax bill. Uh, you know, this has a lot of benefits. The idea that this is going to be unpopular, it's going to stimulate the economy, produce jobs. It's already produced an unexpected gift, which is all of these bonuses that companies did. This is going over very well for the president and for Republicans. I still believe, as I said before, that this is not enough to get them out of a possible hot loss of the House in 2018. They need to do some significant things on the nationalist agenda. I saw that Trump dissolved the voter commission. Their purported reason was that states didn't cooperate. I'm hoping that essentially that was just to free up Chris Kobach, the former secretary of state of Kansas, so that they can give him a better, more significant role over the next few weeks in the administration. So stay tuned. Hopefully that is 
a portent of good things to come. I want to speak for a minute or two on the Iran protests. They, they seem genuine. First thing I should say is they seem genuine. I mean, a lot of people protesting. I've looked at the videos. There are some false ones out there, but some places that I trust, some videos that I've seen, it looks to be genuine. Who knows whether out-of-state actors like Israel or Saudi Arabia or even the United States have provided some assistance in some way or another, but you don't get that many people to take that kind of risks in a surveillance state if it isn't motivated genuinely and, and internally from things that people are unhappy about. I, at the same time, I think it's going to be difficult for those folks to overcome the surveillance state that is Iran. I think they're going to kill until they get it stopped. It appears to be only a few dozen killed so far, but they've turned off all the social media and the country's gone kind of dark, so it's difficult to see what's going on, and I have no doubt that people are being executed. It's So it's difficult to tell what's going on there. My prediction is that probably we don't get a breakthrough in Iran. I think that's the most likely outcome. But it has the elites petrified, though, right? I mean, the reason you're seeing, the if you see all this weird kind of pushback and unwillingness to support the protesters, a desire to somehow put a negative spin on it, where's all that coming from? It isn't just Obama people who, you know, are still defending their Iran deal and that crap. It's also, remember how on our side, People didn't like that Obama killed Osama, even though that was all put in motion and, and W and his people had worked feverishly to try to track the man down. He was actually killed during the Obama administration. And while we all know that he hesitated and had to be talked into that, he still basically gets credit for it. That's just how politics works. And believe me, it's in reverse what's driving a lot of this panic. The idea that Iran's ayatollahs would fall during the Trump administration and that Iran would become a more free country scares the crap out of them. Because, of course, no matter what his actual relationship to it, the president gets the credit for these kinds of things that happen. He gets the blame for the bad things, too. And they, they're they just petrified at the idea that something spectacular like that might happen while Trump's president because they know what a benefit to him that would be politically and they don't want it to happen. They're small people. I think this will probably be a slightly shorter show than normal, but I do want to finish tonight by talking about something worth watching on television. It's a show called Black Mirror. It comes out of the UK, and it plays on Netflix. They just released season four over the weekend, and they it, a season is usually like six episodes, so all told, there are like 20 episodes total of this show. It's basically a modern-day Twilight Zone and, you know, almost all of the episodes focus on something about technology going wrong. Most of the stories take place in the sort of near future, sometime in the, you know, very near future when some technology has come along. And then the story sort of looks at the dark side of how things could go wrong with that technology or sort of how our humanity interfaces with what that technology allows us to do. And they're they're pretty fun and interesting. If you like The Twilight Zone or Outer Limits, you'll enjoy this show. Uh, my review of the fourth season would be it's not quite as good as some of the episodes from previous seasons, but it's it's a good, fine season. They're very interesting episodes, and I still highly recommend the show. It's not like it was a bad season. They're, they're good episodes. Uh, they also very nicely, just like... Twilight Zone every now and again would have a love story or some kind of a positive story so it wasn't always dark. Black Mirror does the same thing. Each season seems to contain one story that isn't sort of the the dark downbeat that all the others are. And this season contained one of those two. It's not the best of all of the seasons as far as the upbeat. There's one from a previous season about two people who find each other in a digital world. And uh, I won't go into too much detail on that. But essentially... When people die, they can, or right before they die, they can upload their consciousness, their memories and everything, and they can continue to exist in a digital world. And it's like kind of like the Matrix. It looks like Earth. Everything looks the same, except that obviously you can't die and you can continue to live on. And that's the technology. Two people meet each other in this world, and it's essentially a love story. And that's probably my favorite of those types of episodes. My favorite of the more of the sort of typical episode is one that I came out in season three that was essentially about all the bees being replaced with little drone bees and what happens when somebody gets control of all of the bees and can make them do what they want them to do. And 
that I it's a, almost a movie because it's about an hour and a half long. And that's probably my favorite of all of the episodes. But it's a good show if you like that kind of thing. And I do highly recommend Black Mirror. Either next week or the week after that here, right around Trump's one-year anniversary, probably before the State of the Union address, we will do our one-year evaluation of the president's term in office. As I said, I didn't feel it was the right to do that and at the end of December because technically he's not sworn in until you know late in January, so he deserved a, f- a few more weeks before I did the report card for him and Republicans. So that's about all the time that we have. You can find this show and other episodes of this show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, YouTube. We play now every day, weekdays, 11 a.m. on the405media.com, and we play on the weekends at 5 p.m. This is a labor of love, but we do need to grow, or we probably won't continue to do this forever. So please like our show and share it with a friend. Trump supporters, you are not alone. Goodbye, Doris. Goodbye, Matt.